update after we've gotten the notification that campus is going to be closed today. So a uh, couple things for everyone whose lab is due today, if you're still working on it and don't want to be on campus at 5 to turn it in, uh, feel free to just send in a PDF copy to Unmull as a, as a virtual timestamp and then turn in a hard copy whenever campus opens again. Um, the Because labs today will be canceled, my plan is to basically have those rescheduled to next week uh, and to postpone the lab for next week. This also means that we'll have to cancel one of the labs. I know, I, you're all so sad. Um, I know it's terrible. Um, we're, we're still deciding what lab is going to be canceled, exactly where we're going to move things around. <laughs> yeah, just cancel the beam bending, even though half, half of it's already done. Um, <clears throat> so the lab that would, the buckling lab that would have been next week will get pushed probably to seventh week, and then I might have the next lab the week after, or I might have another lab two weeks after that. We still need to figure that out, and I'll, I'll be talking with the TAs to figure out exactly what that schedule is going to look like. Um, and we'll get back to you when we figure that out. The midterm, I'm still planning on having it on Monday, but uh, given what happened this past Monday and Tuesday, I have no expectation that campus will be opened because um, if two inches shuts down campus for two days, eight inches is going to, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it's going to do. It'll be fun. So basically, the midterm will be whatever day campus opens back up again. So if that's on Monday, then that's when the midterm will be. If it's later, then it's later. Uh, yeah, I, I can also try if there's some conflict later on. Um, on Monday, I was already planning to have an extra session in the evening. So that, that day at 5 PM, for anyone who, uh, I don't know, can't make it to campus that day or is, is I don't know, something if, if you have some other conflict or if potentially you want extra time you can't uh, can't find a, a time to schedule it otherwise um, my plan is to kind of have sometime in the evening whatever day the midterm is uh, have an extra session but um, if you're interested in that email me uh, or talk to me in in uh, office hours and we can kind of figure that out uh, I will still have office hours from 11 to 12 uh, I know that there will be a mad rush off of campus around 12, so um, I, I'm also going to be meeting the TAs at noon after that, so I'll probably have to cut it off quick at 12. So if you're, if you're planning to come, come prepared with questions. Uh, okay, I think that's the major stuff. Questions, concerns? Yeah, Kevin. I will not. Um, just because it'll take a while to actually write it all out. Um, although if campus keeps getting canceled uh, or campus keeps getting closed and post the midterm gets postponed, I might. Um, but my plan right now is to not have a, an answer key for it. Yeah. Other questions? Cool. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> if it, wait, if it's, are we still doing the, yeah, it, it'll still happen eventually. So right now I'm already, that buckling lab will get postponed to some later time, and I just don't know when. Um, if it gets closed all of next week, so everyone who has their beam bending lab today, oh right, everyone who has their beam bending lab today, we have a, a raw data set that we're going to send out to you, or everyone whose lab was on Tuesday that then got postponed to today or rescheduled to today. We have a raw data set that we'll send you so you can kind of get started on the lab. I know it's not ideal, but uh, we're giving still that two weeks, so hopefully this will be enough time. A lot of it's just going to be the analysis <coughs> anyway, so it, it'll give you some time to look at what the data is, get started on the analysis. And then next week, hopefully, if everything is reopened, you'll be able to actually do the lab after you've already started writing the lab. Um, which is a little bit awkward, but yeah. And so that's why we're postponing the buckling lab cause to, to a later week, because that the bending lab will get rescheduled to next week, hopefully. Yeah. OK, cool. Other questions, concerns? Yeah. So it's plain data sets for everyone in the class, so it should be at everyone. 
Uh, no, it'll be a placeholder for just the people. the people on Friday and people on Tuesday to reschedule to Friday. And then when they get their actual data, they'll be using that. So there's no clean data set to accompany our data? No, it'll just be this one data set. They all, because the lab is, is set up pretty carefully and we're staying in the elastic regime and, and it's pretty well calibrated, all the data should be fairly consistent between things. So there wasn't, it doesn't make too much sense to have another clean data set, but yeah. It hurts a little. <laughs> I know. Sorry. All right. Other questions? Cool. All right. So, midterm review. Uh, let's go through some stuff real quick. So, I had posted those practice problems. Those are kind of an upper bound of difficulty on what will be on the midterm, uh, or above the difficulty that will be on the midterm. Um, realistically, so on, on the midterm right now, the way I have it set it up, it'll be eight questions for conceptual, four uh, numerical, so written problems. Uh, those four conceptual will kind of be from, uh, you may need s still some equations to, to derive things or to understand things, uh, but you won't actually need to uh, draw numbers out or, or uh, to do any actual calculations. Um, the yeah, so four and four is, is my plan for now. It'll be 80 points. Everything will be done within 50 minutes. So hopefully you should be able to finish it within that 50 minute time frame. Uh, the numerical problems will be, so for the, they'll be a little bit more difficult than the examples that I showed in class um, is my plan. They'll be hopefully less, significantly less difficult than the practice problems I gave. But for, I think, kind of throughout the, the quarter or throughout the few weeks so far, I've given a number of examples in class on, on whatever random topics. They'll be a little bit more challenging than that. So if you study those examples um, and know how they're applied really well and can do that, um, then it should be good uh, for actually solving things out. Uh, okay, so actual material that you should know. Let's look at materials. So materials. Uh, in general, <coughs> have an idea that brittle materials uh, brittle materials fail in tension yeah, failure ductile materials fail in shear um, and have some understanding of why that's the case um, brittle materials because of cracks ductile materials because of grain boundary sliding and, and dislocations um, know the hall patch effect, uh, which Hall patch, uh, which is that smaller, smaller grains goes to higher strengths. So um, I think I talked about that sometime on the first or second or second lecture. Um, so just generally understand some of these. These are general materials concepts. Uh, know about uh, how how cold rolling or drawing uh, increases the anisotropy in the material. Anisotropy from cold rolling uh, or drawing drawing extrusion. So any any of these material process or uh, material processing uh, processes. Where you, where you stretch a material out also generally shifts the grains and elongates them in the direction that you're pulling it or extruding it. So you get anisotropic material properties. Um, the, okay, for stress, uh, generally you should understand the our stress cube. So, um, I had shown on one of the first days, or one of the first days we talked about stress, uh, this cube where I had the stresses in all these directions, uh, where this is sigma xx, if this is the x direction, y direction, z direction, this is sigma zz, sigma yy, uh, this one would be sigma xy, this one would be sigma yx. 
uh, and kind of so on for all of the all of the different stress components. Uh, so no, when I when I say I have a stress in the y direction, what that means, um, and then more specifically how that relates if I give you uh, this in a tensor form. So know where each of these components falls <laughs> in the tensor. Z, Z, uh, X, Y, Z, X, Z, Y, Z, and then that it's symmetric. So um, you don't necessarily need to know uh, how this is derived, um, but do know why generally why it's symmetric so so know where, where each of these components on our stress cube what those correlate to in our in a tensor so if i give you a tensor that's like stress equals um one one zero zero um recognize that this is then axial stress so stress in the x and y and no shear components um, and then understand why it's symmetric which is, uh, if you remember, I'd gone through kind of a, a, not a lengthy derivation, but an example showing that uh, basically it's a moment balance uh, around the body that, that causes this to be symmetric. So uh, if I, if the sum of all the shears and around the body makes it. Will we see that the vector form of that for like 6i? Uh, uh, no, yeah, yeah. No, not not expl You will see something of this form for stress and strain. Um, I probably won't do it in that in the six one because that you use that when you're doing the full uh, three dimensionalness or three dimensional elasticity relationships, uh, which I won't. I don't. I won't expect you guys to know for the midterm. It's still, it's it's still good to know because it's how it actually gets done. Uh, in in finite element codes and in upper division solid mechanics classes, but um, yeah, don't worry about it. Just just know this general form. Um, okay, uh, important things. No. No stress transformations. transformations uh, definitely know all of these ones so there's I've given you relations in class um, Sigma X prime is equal to uh, one half Sigma X plus Sigma Y uh, one half Sigma X minus 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 Sigma Y uh, cosine there's a cosine plus x, y, sine of 2 theta, um, and so on. There was one for x, for y prime and, and x, y prime. So this is a, a general stress transformation <coughs> equation for if I know the stress, sigma x, y, sigma x, y, and I know what angle I want to rotate my frame to, this is how I get the new stress in the x direction. And there's a couple of equations that go along with it for the y direction. There was like three different forms of this equation that I had shown you uh, when we were going through and deriving Moore's circle. Uh, you can also just go straight and use Moore's circle for that. So for our Moore's circle, uh, da, da, da. no sigma 1, sigma 2, that there's some center here, uh, some radius, uh, this is a shear stress, this is an axial stress, um, and if I'm looking at two points on my more circle curve, this is a sigma x uh, tau xy, this point is a sigma y tau xy, um, and this then corresponds to a stress tensor, sigma x, sigma y, tau xy, tau xy, um, sure. Uh, C is then sigma x plus sigma y over 2. R is your square root of 
sigma x minus sigma y over 2 squared sigma xy squared, or tau xy squared. Uh, I can write it tau. Um, so from these stress transformations, a couple important things. Generally know how to, how to rotate stress around in space. Um, know that if I uh, know how to find principal stresses from a given arbitrary stress. So if I, I won't be giving you uh, numerically 3D problems to solve. Conceptually, there may be some 3D ones, um, but numerically it'll all be 2D, so I won't give you stress trans you won't have to do stress transformations in 3D, um, but know how to take something like this, find the stress, find the principal stresses, and find the stresses in a, in a rotated coordinate system, find the max shear stress, the angle that the max shear stress would be acting at, the max tensile stress, the angle that the max tensile stress would be at, um, that sort of general thing. So know how to how to rotate this stress around in space, and then in general remember that the stress is a tensorial quantity in a body, which means the stress just kind of exists as as a three dimensional thing in a body. And when you're rotating coordinate systems, you're just looking at it in different directions. Um, so understand that kind of conceptually. Uh, do, do, do. Okay, stress transformations. Strain. Strain. I know this one had thrown a lot of people, so I'm not expecting too much from strain. Know, know the general definitions. General definitions. So just our, our like, E is, is delta L over L here. Uh, and understand the difference between finite and infinitesimal strain. So uh, understand finite versus infinitesimal. Uh, where finite, I, I'd shown the full derivation for it, starting with strain gradients, which I know then through people. Um, so I won't actually be doing any strain stuff. So there was there was our strain equation, uh, one half grad u grad u transpose that I had given, um, and the big E one half grad u grad u transpose um, inside uh, plus grad u transpose grad u. Um, so. Your finite strain is is a higher order function that accounts for large deformations by incorporating this in there. Infinitesimal strain ignores higher order contributions from the deformation, um, and so it's only good for small rotation, small displacement, um, small strain. Uh, based on this assumption, we won't actually be doing anything with this equation. Just generally know what the difference is between these two and how. Maybe not even necessarily how we get there, but just that with what each one is and where each one is applicable. Uh, cool. All right. Uh, elasticity. So now we're getting into constitutive relationships. Elasticity. So um, I had given you a whole bunch of constants to uh, elastic constants to use. So Young's modulus, E, uh, Poisson's ratio, nu, uh, G, uh, here our shear modulus, know generally how these relate to each other. So G is E over two times one plus nu. Uh, our bulk <coughs> modulus, K, is E over one plus nu, one minus two nu, I think. Nope, that's wrong. That's our Lamaze constant. Just kidding. Getting things mixed up. Uh, 3 times 1 minus 2 nu. That's the one. And then Lamaze constant, uh, May parameter, nu e. Here's our 1 plus nu. 1 minus 2 nu. Um, generally understand how we get each of these experimentally. So, E comes from our uniaxial 
retention test, uh, new Poisson's ratio comes from the transverse ex extension uh, during a uniaxial tension test normally. G is from pure shear. Um, bulk modulus comes from hydrostatic compression on a body. And Lemay parameter comes from a volumetrically confined body. So uh, if I have a body in here that I want to apply some strain XX, then I have to have a corresponding stress sigma YY uh, to, to keep it where it is. Because if I strain it, it wants to strain in the opposite direction. So then this is where I pull my limit out of. Um, which now I can't actually remember which side it goes on. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, okay, so know what each of these constants are, how we come up with them. Uh, know Hooke's law in 3D. So Hooke's law in 3D. So this is our um, epsilon xx is 1 over e sigma xx minus nu sigma yy cz um, epsilon or gamma sorry uh, gamma xy is equal to uh, 1 over g sigma xy which is also 2 epsilon xy um, you don't necessarily need to know the difference between or this uh, yeah have nah don't don't worry about this too much the semantics between engineering shear and and uh, true sh or not true shear um, the shear from our derivation just mainly just worry about this one um, yeah okay uh, and there's corresponding ones for epsilon y y is easy um, or you can look at it from the stress uh, point of view and our sigma xx here is uh, 2d epsilon xx plus lambda epsilon xx epsilon yy epsilon zz <coughs> um, which is just the trace of our stiffness of our strain tensor um, and then sigma xy is equal to g gamma xy. Um, so here, our Lame constant, instead of writing all this out, I just kind of pop that in because it's a convenient relationship there. Um, so know um, kind of where these come from, uh, but really more just what these equations are and how to use them for each of the x, x, y, y, z, z for stress going to for getting strain from stress or getting stress from strain. Um, so going both ways. The There's also, or uh, if you know it as a tensorial, in the tensorial uh, relationship, so sigma one, two, three, four, five, six is equal to R E over one plus new one minus two new and then in here there's a whole bunch of one minus new 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 one minus new uh, one minus two new over two two new two one minus new over two and a whole bunch of zeros everywhere else relates to epsilon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Um, this is also fine to understand it in this context. Uh, generally know that these these equations, these this hooks on 3D, is the exact same thing as this tensorial relationship. This is just mathematically an easier way to calculate it. Um, just get a stiffness tensor and invert it to find the strain, or the stiffness tensor and invert it to find a compliance tensor uh, and play with it back and forth. So if you know it in either of these forms, it's fine. So you don't necessarily need to know the what uh, what this is or how to play around with it. 
in general know that it's there, but if you're more comfortable just dealing with the Hooke's Law and 3D equations, that's also generally fine. Uh, okay, also on strain, understand the difference between plane stress and plane strain. So, plane stress, plane strain. Plane stress normally happens with a thin plate. Uh, that, uh, um, where here, because of the free boundary on the outside, there's a zero stress condition there. Uh, on the on the empty face, and so there, the stress in the body we're assuming in the z direction is then zero. So sigma z is sigma x z sigma y z are all equal to zero for plane stress. <coughs> uh, for plane strain, it's when we have a very thick body. Uh, and basically it's, it's difficult to strain it in the through direction because of that volumetric confinement um, and our epsilon zz, epsilon xz, and epsilon yz here are all zero. So um, know when plane stress and plane strain can be applied and then know these simplifications uh, to it. Okay, uh, torsion. So uh, we have a rod that's getting torqued, some twists, T, uh, and it gets twisted by some angle here, theta, uh, that there's some strain gamma now. Uh, where gamma is equal to our theta r over L. We have some length L here. Um, <coughs> the shear stress in the body is T r over J, where uh, J is pi over 2 r not, not 2 to the fourth, um, where r not is our radius of the system. So this torque in here, uh, if I look at a cross section of the body, <coughs> so <coughs> shear stress are this in the elastic region, varies linearly inside here, uh, maximum at the outside. Uh, shear strain is also similar, maximum at the outer radius and zero in the, in the central axis of the beam. <clears throat> okay, uh, I won't expect you to know all the plasticity relationships um, for torsion. That's it was mainly for the lab and going through that derivation there. Um, bending for bending. Uh, so know the general relationships for three-point bending, da, da, da. rollers, if I have some P here, um, know that in this body now there's some uh, Q is a piecewise function, P over 2 minus P over 2 between 0, uh, L over 2, L um, 0 is less than x is less than L over 2, uh, L over 2 less than x is less than L, uh, M is also piecewise, is Px over 2, Pl minus x over 2 from 0 to L over 2, 0, nope, not 0, L over 2 less than x to L. Um, know the maximum deflection here in the central point is uh, P8, PL cubed over 48E 
i, where i is equal to bh cubed over 12 for uh, rectangle uh, or pi over 4 r to the fourth for uh, circle, for circular cross sections. Uh, generally, also understand. Uh, I'm running out of space on these things. Uh, generally, also understand if I have, a, say, like a cantilever beam. and I'm applying some point force to the NP. Here, uh, my Q is going to be a constant. Um, if I had instead a, a beam where I was applying some moment to the M to the end, moment M to the end, uh, M would be a constant here. So this sort of uh, understand how these sorts of boundary conditions then lead to shear force and moment in the body. This generally comes from a force balance. So here, if I have an L, uh, the moment at the root is a force P at a distance L away. So M at x equals 0 is just uh, PL. So generally understand how that comes about just from, from force balances. Know what moment is, know what shear is. Um, and how those come about. Then, uh, importantly, know how stress then relates to moment. So stress is m z over i, where z is now the downward direction of the beam uh, in the beam cross section along the neutral axis. So this is my sigma. Um, the stress <laughs> looks something like this, where if I have, say for my, my three-point bending configuration, there would be some compressive stress on the top, some tensile stress on the bottom. So at the top edge, there's my max uh, compressive pressure. On the bottom edge, there's my max tension. And here in the neutral axis of the beam, there's zero stress, um, just because of the symmetry here. Put this way. OK. So that's generally what you need to know for bending. Um, yes. OK. Uh, then finally, yield surfaces. Yield surfaces. Okay, so know what the three the three main conditions that we talked about are max normal stress, max shear stress, which is a Truska condition, and uh, max distortion energy, which is a von Mises condition. Uh, know what generally those surfaces look like. So uh, understand how we're plotting this, that this is our, our principal stress space here. Which is again why principal stresses are important to understand how to get to. Um, for a max normal stress criterion, max normal, uh, it's good for brittle materials, and generally there's some anisotropy, sigma y tension, sigma y tension. Um, here we have a negative sigma y compression. Sigma y compression. So basically, I say the material will fail if it lands outside of this failure surface and it survives if it stays inside the failure surface. Uh, where here our max normal condition just says if any one of the principal stresses, if sigma 1 or sigma 2 is greater than sigma yield or if sigma 1 or sigma 2 less than negative sigma yield compression. So if, if either of these conditions are met, if, if the max stress in, in the one or 
max principal stress one is greater than the tensile limit, or two is greater than the tensile limit, or they're less than the compressive limit in either of these, then it starts to fail. So we get a cube. Um, the the Tresca and von Mises conditions I'm going to draw a Tresca surface and a von Mises surface kind of lies on top of it or this now is my sigma yield um, the, this surface is a Tresca condition this surface is my Mises condition. Mises. Um, in each of these regions, too, uh, know that this is basically hydrostatic, or this is basically tension in both directions. In this region, this is compression in the one direction, tension in the y direction. So if you remember, this is if we take our shear and we rotate it, so if I have a body in pure shear and I rotate it by 45 degrees, then I get a state that is tension compression um, of the same magnitude. So this is along this negative 45, or along this whatever angle. Um, this is a, effectively a state of shear. Um, sort of, depending on how you're rotating your, your stress frame. Um, out here, this is a state of compression. And over here, this is our state of uh, compression tension. So again, sort of a state of shear. So that's why along this diagonal, where here, we're just looking at the failure in tension. Here, the we're looking at the maximum shear, or the distortion which is sort of like the shear and so shearing now kind of concatenates it so the max normal would kind of be this bounding box here on the outside um, and I'm cutting that off because I'm saying shear now can also cause failure uh, so for Tresca Tresca uh, uh, it's max of Sigma 1 Sigma 2 over 2, sigma 1 minus sigma 3, over 2, sigma uh, 2 minus sigma 3, over 2. Uh, and failure happens when this is greater than or equal to the yield strength over 2. Failure. For von Mises, uh, know, know the relationship in 2D and in 3D. Both of them are useful. Uh, in 3D, uh, I have it in the notes that I'll post. I'm not going to write it all out. In 2D, uh, it's x x squared x uh, x x so basis x x sigma y y y y squared three sigma x y squared is greater than or equal to the yield strength squared or in terms of the principal stresses this is one uh, squared sigma one two sigma two squared uh, is greater than or equal to the yield strength squared so you technically don't need the principal stresses to solve yeah uh, yes good question uh, I thought I'd put that in the canvas announcement. Uh, one, one, eight, eight and a half by eleven, one-sided handwritten. Um, cal calculator is fine. Uh, closed book, closed notes. <laughs> Thank you. I can't believe I forgot to mention that. Uh, yes. Okay. So here you don't need principal stresses to figure out the von Mises failure criterion or condition, but it's kind of a little bit easier to do the calculation if you have them. Um, okay, that is a general overview of all the stuff you should know for the midterm. Yeah. How to? Sorry, say that again. The 
the combined stiffness tensor? Compliance. Oh, the compliant. Oh, stiffness Four. compliance tensor. Uh, no, so not necessarily. No, no Hooke's law in three D, which then is the same thing as the stiffness or compliance tensor. So these are these are equivalent. You can use either one, whichever you feel more comfortable with. Um, if you want to use the full stiffness compliance tensor, that's totally fine. Um, yeah, but you don't need to know it necessarily. But you do need to know one or the other of these. Either these Hooke's Law equations in 3D or um, the stiffness compliance tensors and how those relate. I know, exciting. Ooh. All right, other questions? We got like 10 minutes or so. It's weird. You have 10 minutes to spare. <coughs> like we're normally like buzzing and like trying ah. Yeah, I know. Well, I tried to leave time for questions. <laughs> uh, that's strange. It's yeah. weird. Yeah. Questions, concerns? Or we can just talk about how bad snowy weather is. That's also fine. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah, I, I can try to get like just raw answers. For some of them, they're conceptual. So like some of the problems it was defined in your own words, strength and toughness and whatever. Yeah, for the, cap for the calculations, I can try to come up with some numbers. Yeah, but whether or not, yeah. I guess then if you if you end up at a at a wrong answer, you may just kind of be stumbling around, trying to figure out why if there's not like a guide. Yeah, it's better than nothing. I'll I'll try to come up with something. Yeah. Um, one two. Robert. Will we have to uh, calculate or approximate uh, modules of toughness and resilience at all? Uh, probably not. I wasn't planning on it just because the proper way to do it is an integral of the of the full strength stiffness, the full strain, st strength, stress strain relationship, the full stress strain where you take an integral over that. So I would need to give you a function. And then it's just an exercise in how well you know how to take integrals. Um, yeah, so probably not. For n numerically for the labs, it's easier because then you just take a, a series sum. But yeah, so don't worry about that too much. Yes. Okay. Other questions? Uh, well, you have to know what, how things fail. Um, not for anything super complicated. So, generally, no for materials, brittle materials fail in tension, ductile materials fail in shear, um, and understand generally why, because of cracks and voids and because of dislocations and crane boundary sliding. Um, but I, pr I probably won't give anything weird like wood. Um, yeah. Also, homework, the homework three solutions are up on the website now uh, for anyone who wants to look at those. Yeah. So the homework problems, the level of conceptual difficulty in the homework problems will be similar to the difficulty in the exam. Um, so that is the, the thing that will be one to one. And then, um, yeah, if, if this class didn't have such a heavy lab load, the, the problems in the practice sheet that I gave are similar to homework problems that I would likely have given, but did not because I knew it would, that on top of labs is not super fun. Um, yeah, but so conceptual problems homework are similar to exam conceptual problems. Yes. Other questions? 
concerns. All right, if there's nothing else, I'll see you guys hopefully next week. Good luck with the snow. Hey.